All right, so this is asking um, measure angle BAD. So it's question 15 on the homework. Uh, my, my thought, guys, is I'm not going to, and there's a lot of questions that are like this, I'm not going to try to right away, right off the bat, uh, just try to find angle BAD. I'm going to figure out all the things that I do know about this problem. And does it ask, is that the, so the one thing, this is a, I guess what I was asking, does it ask throughout the question for other angle measurements or not? Oh. Or is it just one part? Just one part, okay. If it is just asking for that one part, I guess we could probably, because this is a parallelogram, right? So what do you know about that side right there and that side right there? They're parallel. So then that means um, this segment must be a transversal, correct? Now, if I ignore all the other parts, ignore that, ignore that, so that 60 would go away, that 33 is going to go away. What would B to A to D, what would that angle have to be? It'd be acute, but wouldn't it be the 29 degree? Isn't that angle right there alternate interior to that one? Yeah. So that's what they're asking for there is that that's 29. Wait, really? Yep. Now, what I was saying at the beginning is that a lot of questions like that, you're going to see them later on, is that they, they're going to ask you what's BAD, but then they're, when you type that in, they're going to ask you for another angle. So there might be three, four, five angles. We could find a lot of different angle measurements here. If that's, tw if that's 29, okay, can I do a similar thing because this side here is parallel to that side, right? Is this then, is D to E a transversal? So, like I always look for that, it looks like to me like a Z. If I look for that Z, or in this case maybe like a backwards or upside down N, but that angle there and that angle, I'm always looking for those things, right? Are those coarse or alternate interior? So they gotta be the same. So I can transfer that 60 to there Okay. Likewise, if I look at um, this here, this this uh, parallel line, that parallel line, in that transversal, can this be 33? So that angle there would be 33 degrees. Um, now, we might think just based on that stuff that we we can't go any further. But let's let's just real quick. Uh, kind of think about what we got here. 30, what's 33 plus 29? 62. So that angle is 62 degrees. Is that angle also 62 degrees? Is that a property that we said should be true in parallelograms yesterday? That opposite angles should be the same? Okay. So right now I've got 62 degrees plus 62 degrees plus then... I got a 60 and a 60, right? Okay. Now, how many? So that's four. Uh, what's that? 24. So 244 so far, right? How many degrees should there be in this entire 360? So if there's 360 and I've used 244 so far, there should be, what, 116 degrees left over? Does that make sense? So there's 116 degrees left over for that one and for that one. And what do you know about those two angles? They have to be what to one another? They have to be congruent. They're alternate interior again, so they have to be congruent. So they both have to be 58, don't they? Does that make sense to everybody? So you can go through. Now, if you wanted to, you could also find those angles right there in the middle because we have 58 and 29 of a triangle. So this has to be then 180 minus 58 minus 29 if we wanted to find that angle. Um, just looking at the parallelogram though, if I look at that purple angle there and any of the consecutive purple angles, so let's look at this one here, what should those add up to if it's a parallelogram? That's 62, right? The top angle is 62. 
This one here is 118, correct? What's 62 plus 118? 180. Didn't we say yesterday that consecutive angles had to be supplementary? Okay. So even in that problem, they just ask you for that green angle. They could ask you a barrage of different um, angle measurements, and we should be able to find all of them. Okay. And all the relationships that we talked about yesterday in those five theorems should still hold true. So that was question – does that help answer question 15? Yeah. Uh, Somebody said 18. So the perimeter of a parallelogram ABCD is 88. AD is 14 more than twice AB. Find the lengths of our four sides of ABCD. Okay, so the algebra here says... Um, Let's see here. So the perimeter of parallelogram ABC, ABCD is 88. AD is 14 centimeters more than twice AB. Uh, in this phrase right here, what segment AD or AB, which one of those do they give you more information about? They tell me more about AD. Okay. So what I'm going to do is once I identify the one they tell me more about, the other one is going to be my variable. I'm going to let A, B end up being X. Okay? Uh, and you can, you can do this a multiple uh, set of ways. Uh, mo I think most people prefer using like X as your variable, but you could use A, B as your variable if you wanted to. Okay? Um, but if AB is X, then AD, they're saying AD is, so equals, 14 more. So 14 more means 14 plus, right? Or plus 14. And twice AB, what's twice AB mean? 2X. 2X. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, if you wanted to use AB as your variable, you would just say that AD is equal to 14 plus two ABs. Um, and then just solve for AB. Um, but now it says the perimeter is 88. So let's look at this. So we've got A, B, C, D. I know AB is X, right? What does this side right here have to be? It's got to be X, right? Okay. Now, I drew this like kind of like a rectangle, but a rectangle is a parallelogram. Um, but opposite sides have to be congruent, right? What is this side? So B, or sorry, AD has to be 14 plus 2X, right? So then BC also has to be 14 plus 2X. And now what I want to talk about here is obviously... AD should be longer, right? Okay, because it's 14 more than twice them. So as long as X is a positive distance, which it has to be for this, to, this shape to exist, then AD should be the longer side. My picture doesn't support that, but my picture is only there to provide me insight on what I'm really supposed to be doing with these numbers, okay, or these expressions. If we're talking about perimeter, Perimeter is starting at one vertex and adding all the sides up until I get back to that vertex, right? So I'm going to take x plus x plus 14 plus 2x plus 14 plus 2x, and that should equal 88. So how many total x's do you have throughout this? Six. And then the 14s add together to give me 28. Should equal 88. So 6x then is equal to 60. X for me ends up being 10. So when they ask what AB is, AB is the X value, so that's 10. And then AD, if they ever want that, would be 34. I'm going to plug that back in.
that kind of help with that? Okay. Any others on that you guys want to talk about? 17. All right, so it says find the values of X and Y in parallelogram PQRS, knowing that PT is Y, TR is 5X plus uh, 1, and QT is 2Y, and TS is 6X plus 10. Okay. What do we know? So those are, what are these, what do we call these segments that they're describing here inside our parallelogram? Vocabulary wise, what do we call those things? Uh, a feature of them is that they're bisectors. But what are they for the parallelogram? They connect non-consecutive vertices. Let's look at D. Those diagonals. Okay. And what we learned yesterday, one of our theorems, was that the diagonals of a parallelogram are bisectors of one another. Okay. So this kind of used a bad color here. It doesn't can't really see the difference between the two colors. So that red diagonal will bisect that green one, and that green one will bisect the red one. Does that make sense? So what that does for us is it's going to, if, it's, if they're bisecting, that's going to make that distance of 2y the same thing as that distance 6x plus 10. So we're going to write the equation 2y equals 6x plus plus 10. And then it also allows us to say on the green, because the, the red one is going to bisect the green diagonal, we can say y, and what is that, 5x plus 1? So y is the same thing as 5x plus 1. Okay. Now as we do these problems, the next problem or the next one you see like this uh, it could be set up completely, it's the, you, you approach it the same way, but the two equations that you generate might be completely different, okay? This one, I think, because it's a system of equations, this one sets itself up for substitution the best. Because I've got y solved for, does that make sense? So everywhere in the blue one that I see y, I'm going to replace it with that 5x plus 1. Other problems might set them, so just depending on how the the uh, expressions are configured, might set itself up for like elimination uh, to be the best route. But here I think substitution is our um, best option. So I'm gonna put five X plus y, or one in for that Y. And then I'll go ahead and solve that. Now, you've got options here. Just I think most people would probably do what over here? Most people are gonna distribute. I'm going to foreshadow a little bit. I'm going to think, okay, I can distribute, make those twice as big, and that's not hard. But is this 2 being multiplied by this quantity, 5x plus 1? And 5x plus 1 is just an object. It's just a number. So how can I get that 2 separated from this thing? Okay, divide by 2. And now this situation, I would always do this because I looked over here, and I saw both these numbers were what kind of numbers? They're even. So if I divide by 2 over here, it just makes my next part of my equation, it has smaller coefficients. Um, obviously, either way, I think we should be able to do, um, but sometimes that, that turns out to be an efficiency thing uh, with like mental math or whatever that, that might make things uh, quicker for you. So subtract 3x from both sides, I get 2x. Subtract 1 from both sides, I get 4. So here I'm getting x to be 2. And when I want to solve for y, I'll plug that back in here. And it'll give me y to be 11. Does that help? Um, anything else?
Yeah. What I would like to do for a little bit today is get us on track to be able to do the following. I want to eventually give you maybe ordered pairs like this. Let me zoom in so you guys can see this a little bit better. I'd like to be able to give you order pairs like what I have here on this shape and just ask you to prove to me using some algebra, whether it may be slopes, perpendicular lines, distances, midpoint, formula, that kind of stuff, prove to me that that thing's a parallelogram. Okay? Uh, so at the onset, it looks like it might be. Okay, but it might not be, and we want to be able to decipher this, okay? So, if we wanted to be able to determine that this is a parallelogram, going off the definition of a parallelogram, what does the definition of a parallelogram say? Okay, a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides, okay? So when I'm talking about parallel sides, in the coordinate plane or parallel lines in the coordinate plane, what mathematical feature about lines allows us to determine whether something is parallel or not? So again? Okay, so they stay straight, they go on, the, the distance between them never changes, but what is the mathematical component that guarantees that? It's the slope, okay? So if the slope of the lines are the same, then that guarantees that the distance between the two lines never changes. So if I want to look at, let's say, that side there and that side there, let's make those red. If I want to look at those red sides and I want to determine whether they are parallel or not, I'm going to have to determine what the slopes are, okay? So do we remember our slope formula? Uh, that's your um, slope intercept form for an equation of a line. But the M, how do I find the M in that equation? Rise over run. So that's Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. And that's, you know, rise over run is okay, but rise over run is kind of like a... Uh, uh, shortcut, kind of fundamental type approach if, and it only works if your um, coordinates are integers. So if I were to give you like fraction, order pairs, or a decimal, or uh, algebraic, so maybe I gave you instead of like negative 6, 1, I gave you like negative A comma R. Um, counting cannot be conducted there. You'd have to use the formula. Um, but here, if I want to find the red ones, I'm going to say, you know, this is X1, Y1 x2, y2, and I'll find the slope of that, okay? So the slope of, let's say, a, b, okay, it's going to be 2 minus 1. So 2 minus 1 is going to be 1, right? And it's going to be negative 1 minus negative 6, negative 1 minus negative 6. Does that give me 5? So the slope of that is 1 fifth. Then I want to do the same thing for the slope of the other red line, which is DC. And we can go, so I'll let this one be X1, Y1 here, and that be X2, Y2 there. So I go negative 1 minus negative 2, subtract your Ys, and I'll go negative 4 minus negative 9. What's negative 1 minus negative 2? 1. What's negative 4 minus negative 9? 5, right? What... What is the relationship between those two slopes? 
They're the same, right? So that tells me these red lines are parallel. Okay, so now, if the red lines are parallel, so far we have shown that we have a quadrilateral, a four-sided figure, with exactly one side of parallel sides. So right now, if I'm trying to classify that, does anybody know the, the quadrilateral that has one pair of parallel sides, what we call that? So it's with a T. Trapezoid, okay? Right now, because I haven't gone any further, the best I can classify that is a trapezoid, because I don't know anything about the blue sides. Does that make sense? If I can find that the blue sides are not parallel, then we can guarantee that's a trapezoid. If we find that the blue sides are parallel, it changes from a trapezoid to a parallelogram. Does that make sense? So now we want to do the same thing with the blue sides. So, um, again, you just have to redefine what you want X1, Y1 to be. So I'll say the slope of AD. I'll let this be one X1, Y1. This one be X2, Y2. So we'll go one minus negative two, and then negative six minus negative nine. What's one minus negative two? Three. What's negative six minus negative nine? Three. So my slope is one. And then I'll do the same thing over here. So slope of BC, two minus negative one, gives me three up top, and then negative one minus negative four, three on the bottom, gives me one again, right? So that tells us the blue ones are parallel, therefore we have a parallelogram, right? Now, finding slopes not, shouldn't be a terrible thing. I mean, you guys did that a lot last year. Um, so finding slope four times should be something maybe we're, we're capable of doing, but that's not all that enjoyable, correct? You guys agree with that? Okay. Um, that is proving that something is a parallelogram using the definition of a parallelogram. Case two up there says, um, let's go through this showing lengths. What did you, what do you know? And this is even worse to be honest with you. What do you know? about um, the lengths of sides in a parallelogram. They should be what to one another? Okay, so which one should be equal? Okay, so, so each set that is parallel, the opposite sides, they should be congruent, right? Okay, so if I want to look at the red one and I want to find the length of the red one, do you guys remember... We've talked about this a lot. This formula. Okay. If I use that formula to find this red distance and then find that formula, find that distance there, if those two become the same value, then I know my opposite sides and or the red opposite sides will be congruent. Now, the one thing that I think is important is that we... I erased it, I shouldn't have. Uh, but in the slope, when we did the slope, did we do x2 minus x1 in the slope? Is that part of our slope formula? x2 minus x1 is also part of our distance formula. Okay? So if you have to do a slope, inside the slope, you have the components that you need to find distance. Same thing for the y2 minus y1, that's in your slope. That's a component to find your distance. So, running through those again, x2 minus x1. So if I go negative 1 minus negative 6, that's 5, right? So I'll have 5, and I'll square that. Plus then, if I two, take 2 minus 1, that's 1, and I'll square that, okay? So order of operations tells you you have to do exponents first. So that's 25 plus 1, which will give me radical 26. Okay? Yes? Okay. Yes? Say that again. Like it says, the formula is x2 minus x1. Mm -hmm. so you use the y values. I use the y values. So, so here I use so those. I went so that was so negative one minus negative six would give me that five, right? And that's where I got that. But then this part of the formula says I got to use y2 minus y1. So 2 minus 1 will give me 1. 
and then I'll square that. Does that make sense? And, and really what we're doing here is, if we think about it, is that this red segment, let's see here. That red segment right there is actually a hypotenuse of that triangle right there. You guys see that right, right triangle? And what do we use in the right triangle to find the length of a hypotenuse? We use a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And this, this here is the a squared. This is the b squared. So this is the length of this horizontal leg. This is the length of that vertical leg. If we square them, add them together, that gives me c squared, which is when we take the square root of to find the actual length of the... So when we do this, this is formula, we're actually doing the Pythagorean theorem. Um, but now, I, if I'm going to do this red, this other red side, I better get radical 26 when I'm done, right? Or it's not going to be a parallelogram. So then, so distance equals, come down here, take negative 1 minus negative 2. So negative 1 minus negative 2 is 1, right? We'll square that. So that's my y's. And then I go negative 4 minus negative 9. Negative 4 minus negative 9, that is 5 again. Is that still going to give me radical 26? So that tells me that the red one's working to run. Okay. Now, if the red ones were congruent, okay, and that's all we knew, we would not be able to classify this as a parallelogram, okay? We would just, it would still just be a quadrilateral. We wouldn't know anything else about it. We now need to do the same thing for the blue ones. And just to save a little bit of time here, I'll just go do one, one of these blue distances. I'm going to go 1 minus negative 2. 1 minus negative 2 is 3. And I'll go negative 6 minus negative 9. Negative 6 minus negative 9 is also 3. So what we end up with is, what, 18? So radical 18 would be that blue distance there. You, if you remember when we did slope, we got these slopes to be the same. This was a, it was 3 over 3. Well, the 3 over 3, those are those numbers right there in the, in the distance formula. So this side will be radical 18 as well. And we're able to show both sides congruent, both pairs of opposite sides congruent, and that would allow us uh, to confirm that that thing is a parallelogram. Does that make sense? Okay. Was that a lot of work? Finding, is, is finding distance more uh, of a workload than finding slope? I think it is too. I, I think of the, of the calculations that we usually have to find in the coordinate plane, distance is the most elaborate. Okay. So if I can avoid that, maybe down the road I will try to do that. Okay. Case 3 says show that opposite angles are congruent. Now right now, because we have no basis of trigonometry, and even if we did have like a geometry understanding of trigonometry, um, finding angles in the coordinate plane is pretty difficult. Okay, So we're not going to be able to do that in the coordinate plane. But the next one talks about the diagonals. What was the, what was the feature about diagonals? We talked about it in, the, in that first question, number 15 in the homework today. What is the feature about diagonals that is true about parallelograms? Okay, so, so both diagonals bisect each other, meaning that when they cross, when they cross the diagonal AC, the diagonal AC, that midpoint has to be the same as the midpoint for BD. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you guys remember how to find the midpoints of segments in the coordinate plane? Okay, good. So the midpoint, which is an x comma y, it's an ordered pair, is x1 plus x2 divided by 2, y1 plus y2 divided by 2. And x1 and y1, x2, y2, those are the endpoints of your um, diagonals. So if I take that number there, that number there, and add them together, what's well, negative 6 plus negative 4? Negative Adam at negative six. So if you, you owe somebody six dollars and then you take from them another four dollars, be negative ten, right? 
So negative 10 over 2. And then what's 1 plus negative 1? 0. So 0 divided by 2 is just 0, right? So right now I'm getting negative 5, 0 as the midpoint of that blue segment, right? Add the x's of your diagonal, divide by 2. Add the y's, divide by 2. Okay? Now let's find the red diagonal. Let's find the midpoint of that. Take that number, which is the x of that endpoint, and add it to that one. So it's negative 9 plus negative 1. Negative 10 divided by 2. Add that y value and that y value. What's that give you? 0, right? Divided by 2 gives you 0. That will repair is negative 5, 0, correct? What do you notice about those two? They're the same. And if the midpoints are the same, that gets us to arrive at the conclusion that those two diagonals are indeed bisecting each other because they share the same midpoint. So, or the same location as the midpoint of the midpoint. So what that tells us is that's a parallelogram. Now here's my opinion. If you had an option, do you guys, do you guys like to subtract or do you like to add? Like to add, right? All the other formulas, uh, slope and distance, use subtraction. Okay? Slope asks us to do some division uh, that may not always be the easiest thing to do, but that division isn't, I, I guess, impossible in slope. Okay? But slope, we had to do four things, right? We had to find four slopes here to prove this a parallelogram. I only had to find two midpoints, right? Okay? So, in my opinion, and hopefully you guys can maybe agree with this at some point, is that if I have the task of taking a parallelogram, any parallelogram that is provided, maybe that one there, and somebody asked me, can you prove that's a parallelogram? I can either find four slopes, kind of tedious, find four distances, also kind of tedious, or I can find two midpoints, which is just adding and dividing by two, and I only have to do it twice. That's a little bit less tedious, isn't it? Okay, so finding, using that property to identify whether something's a parallelogram is going to be very uh, efficient in comparison to our other options. Okay, now if, and I think we saw this yesterday in an example, if um, I give you a polygon that looks like Uh, maybe, maybe like that, okay? Um, it might look, just because it's, and, and it, right now it's, I think it looks pretty obvious that that's not going to be a parallelogram, right? Okay? Uh, but there are some that they draw uh, that they change this value right here, this coordinate, to maybe something like that. Okay? Still looks like a parallelogram, but it's not just by a little bit. But if I'm a little bit more drastic with it, and I ask you, can we determine whether this thing's a parallelogram or not? I think the easiest thing for us to do is to look at this and use the... All right, then do what I want to do. There we go use the midpoints to determine whether this is a parallelogram or not. I don't want all these labels on here. What's going on? Oh, well. Don't worry about those orange labels. Um, if I want to determine whether this is a parallelogram or not, let's find the midpoint. Let's find the midpoint of this segment right here. Okay? So if I take negative 19 and add to it negative 9, what's negative 19 plus negative 9? Negative 28 divided by 2, right? Okay? What is negative 12? plus negative 9. Negative 21, right? Divide that by 2. So that's the midpoint of that diagonal. 
Let's look at that diagonal. If I take negative 17 plus negative 10, what's negative 17 plus negative 10? Negative 27. Now, I, to be honest with you, I don't even need to now look at the y value because do I automatically know now that because the x values are different that those points are completely different? So this is not going to be a parallelogram because my midpoints are different. If you did want to find the, the y values, do end up both being uh, negative 21 halves, okay? Uh, but the x values are different, so it's not a parallelogram. Is it okay? Um, that is kind of the nuts and bolts of what I wanted to talk about for the most part today. Uh, there are some theorems in today's notes that I want you guys to, to write down. Basically what happened in section 6.3 is all the converses of what we learned in 6.2. 6.2 said, if we have a quadrilateral that has, um, or sorry, if we, if we have a quadrilateral that is a parallelogram, so we start with a parallelogram, and we are able to determine that both pairs of opposite sides are congruent, okay? That's the conclusion that we know from having a parallelogram. Today, we can find the converse of that, basically saying, now if you have a four-sided figure, and you know both pairs of opposite sides are congruent, then that four-sided figure actually has to be a parallelogram, okay? So the converse of everything we talked about yesterday. Here it says if both pairs of opposite sides of quadrilateral are congruent, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram, okay? Uh, yesterday, it said in a parallelogram, both pairs of opposite sides are congruent, okay? Is that okay with everybody? And that's, that was, this is what was allowing us in that, um, GeoGebra at first when we did this, uh, the distances um, to guarantee that that shape once we found the distance I think we found it to be like radical 26 and radical 18 or something like that um, and make the argument based off of those values why was that a parallelogram that's because of this theorem here this is the converse of what we talked about yesterday so essentially, all the theorems in this section today are converses of yesterday's. I think there's one new theorem here that we'll talk about that's pretty useful. Um, skip that proof. Here it says, if one pair of opposite sides of a quadrilateral are both congruent and parallel, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. This one's the one that's different. This was not expressed yesterday in anything. What this is saying is if we have a quadrilateral where you're able to show that that side is parallel to that side, okay? And for whatever reason, you can't determine whether the other sides are parallel, but you can determine that this side is also congruent to that side, knowing nothing about the other sides, that is going to guarantee that we have a parallelogram. Okay? So one set of opposite sides having both conditions of being parallel and congruent is enough to say that the shape's a parallelogram. Okay? The reason I like that one is if you remember going through that distance formula and the slope formula, we talked about how those are the same, right? Or they use the same component. So if I wanted to find the slope of the top and the bottom here, x2 minus x1, or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, if I find the, the, the slope of the top and the slope of the bottom, I already have all the things I need to find the distance of the top and the distance of the bottom. And I don't really have to worry about finding the slopes and distances of the other sides. All right, so that's a nice tool sometimes to, to be able to use in the coordinate plane if we if we have to. Is that okay with everybody? Now, what I want you to make sure that we understand is that this, if I were to say that like that side's parallel to that side and that side's congruent to that side, this does not guarantee to 
to be a parallelogram. It might be, but it doesn't guarantee, okay? All that one guarantees is that we might have a trapezoid, okay? Um, because that doesn't say that one set of side, opposite sides is both congruent and parallel. That says one side is parallel and one side, one other side is congruent. Does that make sense? Okay, so just be cautious on that. Um, yesterday we said in a parallelogram, both pairs of opposite angles are congruent. Today it says if you have a quadrilateral with both pairs of opposite angles congruent, then that shape has to be a parallel there. Excuse me. Working in the coordinate plane with angles, like I said, is, is very difficult unless the angles are right angles. Um, right angles in the parallel or in the, the coordinate plane can be found by using slopes. Um, doing or finding angles in the coordinate plane that are not right angles involves using sine, cosine, and tangent, which is some, some trigonometry that we haven't experienced yet. <laughs> Key thing here is that's got to be both pairs of opposite angles. It can't just be one pair. It has to be both pairs. Um, eventually, you're going to see questions in homework, tests, and quizzes. But I'll give you a shape like this, and I'll do something like that. And I'll say, are or is that enough information to determine whether that shape is a parallelogram or not? And in this case, it'd be, it'd be no. We don't have enough information. But once I do something like this, now you do, right? Or I might do something um, maybe like this and then like that and I'll ask, is that enough information? So what do you how, how is that enough information? What what theorem are you telling me then? No, because because the the alternate interior angles, I need a diagonal in here. I don't have that drawn in. You want to have the so in this this image here, I don't have enough information. I've got a lot of congruency, parallel, that kind of stuff going on, but they don't order themselves in a manner in which I can guarantee uh, a parallelogram. But if I do this, now is it a parallelogram? Because now I've got one pair of opposite sides being both congruent and parallel. Okay. Um, we'll get we'll get a lot of practice at that and seeing what conditions require are required to make a parallelogram uh, and which requirements won't make a parallelogram. Uh, we got two more theorems here. If an angle is supplementary with both of its consecutive angles, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So I might do something like this. where I'll put like, I don't know, 40 there. And then 140 here and 140 there. And I'll ask you, is that enough information to guarantee that it's a parallelogram and that with a red angle, it is supplementary with both of its consecutive black angles of 140. Um, and that, the reason that works is because if these are these are same side interior angles and they're supplementary, so if those are same side interior angles or supplementary, it's gonna make that top and bottom parallel. And then these two angles are again same side interior angles, so they're supplementary with making those lines parallel. So it does give me a parallelogram. And the last theorem I want you guys to write down. Is the one that is most useful to us. It's the most time saving theorem. If the diagonals of quadrilateral bisect each other, then the 
quadrilateral to parallel okay. You might even want to write uh, if the diagonals share the same midpoint okay, or contain the same midpoint, um, then the quadrilateral is a parallel linear. Again, all, for the most part, all converses of what we talked about yesterday. And that's what we want to do, I think, inherently, as math learners, we want to, when we see a statement, we want to read it and then say, oh, it's reversible. Okay, use it both ways. Not all statements in mathematics can you do that with. These here with parallelograms, you can't. Is that okay? Well, I'm going to post an assignment for 6.3, and what you're going to find out is the assignment for 6.3 eerily similar to the assignment for 6.2. Okay? Uh, really going to approach a lot of the questions the same way. Right. Um, I would anticipate a little bit of a uh, short quiz tomorrow over 6.1 and 6.2. Um, going to have some terms on it, a couple problems that you got to calculate. Maybe angles and certain measurements with uh, that N minus 180 formula and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so, but it won't take, it will, it will not take you the whole period tomorrow. Did she make a multiple choice?